He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Some of you may, may be wondering who's up here preaching to you. Uh, my name is John Bechtel. I'm the, the new executive pastor here at Chapel Street Church. Uh, I've been here for three months. What is an executive pastor? Well, I work with Pastor Jeff to maintain and develop the vision for who we are as a church and who we are as a people. And then I, I work with the staff to make sure that we're executing that vision so that you, the people of Chapel Street, can make an impact in your world. So. That's a little bit of what I do. I've been here for three months, so I have it all figured out. <laughs> That's a joke. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate that. We're, we're in the process of uh, figuring all things out, and I've been very grateful for the way that my family and I have been welcomed uh, by, by you, the body of Christ here in Geneva. Um, to give you a little background about myself, I spent the last 13 years before coming here serving as an executive pastor in Evanston, Illinois. Our, our church was two blocks from Northwestern, so you can imagine our, camp, our, our church was full of students. Um, for the 11 years uh, prior to that, I was working in Christian higher education, serving in student development and administration. So, um, so I have a lot of student, uh, student life in my background. And all along those uh, 24 years, the Lord has uh, gifted my wife and I with four daughters. So... Uh, my life is uh, inundated with students, and it's been a, been a joyful ride to, uh, just to be with students, to experience their, their joy for life and uh, their zeal for, for uh, doing what is good. Now, I do need to confess that having been around students so long, I, I, I'm acutely aware that we're entering a unique uh, season for our students, and it may not be what you think it is. You see, we're entering a time I like to call extra credit season. Uh, our students who are overachievers, what are they doing? They're trying to get every single point possible so they can further their academic careers, right? So that's what, what our overachievers are doing. And maybe there's some underachievers who are trying to get every single point possible so they can maintain and keep their academic careers going. Um, it is a time of extra credit uh, in, in the life of our students. We know that. There's a lot of different ways you can get extra credit, right? One of my favorite extra credit questions I've ever heard comes from my friend Eric Tonis. Eric Tonis teaches uh, theology at Biola University. And at the, end of, uh, at the end of the semester, after he has taught them all about the great things of God and who their identity in Christ is and what it means to follow Jesus, he gives this one question. And he has to sh change it, obviously, because uh, students catch on, but but the first time he asked the question, he asked this. What is the name of the person who cleans your building? At first thought, you think, what in the world? What does that have to do, do with anything when it comes to theology? But I think it's one of the best extra credit questions I've ever heard. You see it. I think we understand it. You can study the great things of God. You can learn all about who God is and, and what he has done. You can discover your identity in Christ, but if it doesn't make a difference, and if it doesn't make a difference at home and where we live, what's the point? Paul is all about making the same point in all of his letters. Who Jesus is and what he has done for us, that changes everything. And it's a radical reorientation that starts with where we live, in our homes, and particularly with our families. And we've been going through the book of Colossians, and I want you to hear how Paul lays out his argument. Now, I'm an old-fashioned old preacher. I'd like you to turn to uh, Colossians 3. I want you to have your head in the Word and make sure that we're following along. So um, I'm actually going to be starting in chapter 1. Let's just unpack the big picture of what this, this book is. In chapter 1, what do we see? We see the supremacy of Jesus over all things. All things were made through him. All things were made by him. All things were made for him. 
All things are for Jesus. We need to start there. And then in chapter 2, we, we have a, this beautiful description of what Jesus did on our behalf, right? We've been raised with him, and we're forgiven through him. We have new life in Jesus. Don't let those words fall away because we've heard them a hundred times. We have new life in Jesus. Now chapter 3 starts with this if-then statement. If we have been raised in Christ, if we've been made alive in him, what are we to do? Well, what does verse 1 say? We're to seek the things that are above. Verse 2, we're to set our minds on things above. Verse 5, we're to put to death that which is earthly in us. Remove it. In verse 12 to 16, we see we're to put on the attributes of who Jesus is. Being in Jesus changes everything. What we think about, how we think, what we desire, what we run from, and what we run to. Being in Jesus changes everything everywhere in our lives. Even down to the practical details of, of who we are and how we do life in our home. You see, God wants the home of those who are raised with Christ to be a radical and normal place where we live out our ordered relationships for his honor and the sake of the world. Let me say that again. God wants the home of those who are raised with Christ to be a radical and normal place where we live out our ordered relationships for his honor and for the sake of the world. Now let's look specifically at this passage and look at how specific Paul gets into these ordered relationships. Starting in Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. Masters, provide your, your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. This, uh, this passage is, is famous for a lot of reasons, but it's one of the reasons it's famous is because we're going to have to unpack a lot before we actually get into the text. We need to make sure we're all on the same page here. So there's a few things I'd like to get straight uh, before we jump in. First, we really need to consider how this, this passage must have sounded to the Colossians when they first heard this letter. Actually, they would have been very familiar with these categories of, of husband and wife, of parent and child and slave and master. Aristotle himself actually lists these same exact categories 400 years before in talking about the ordering of a, of a home. So this was very, uh, very, um, uh, very familiar language to the Colossians, but we're going to see that Paul turns it, turns it on its head. You see, Aristotle uh, and the Greco-Roman world may have talked about the, these house codes, um, but they, did, they had a very different emphasis. The emphasis was really on ruling. Uh, Aristotle talks about the constitutional rule over the wife and the royal rule over slaves and children. That, that's what the father has over slaves and children, the, the husband has over the wife. Aristotle actually goes so far as to quote Homer when he says, Homer has appropriately called Zeus the father of the gods and men because he is the king of them all. For a king is the natural superior to his subjects. So very hierarchical, very power-oriented, focused on the father and the husband. So, which leads to the second point. And Paul uses these familiar household codes, but he turns them on their head. This isn't about the person in power. This is about the Lord. This is about, um, because it's about the Lord, then it's going to be about love. We're going to see radical personhood being given to all people in the family. 
And I want to look at this argument real quick that, that Paul unpacks. And again, let's uh, jump into chapter 3. Paul is giving this argument for uh, why love and the lordship of Christ should rule in our families. So starting in, in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, If you have been raised with Christ, what do we do? We behave like Christ the rest of the chapter, putting, on, putting to death the things that don't belong in our lives and putting on those things that Christ has called us to. But look at verse 11. Don't miss verse 11. Brothers and sisters, as, as human beings before God in Christ, we are of equal worth and value. We are all made in God's image, and we have all been saved, and we are all one in Christ. We need to understand that. And then Paul wants to make sure we understand, before we get into these household codes, that everything we do, everything we do, is about Jesus. Remember chapter 1, all things were made, made through him and all things were made for him. And Paul really wants us to get the lordship of, of Christ over this household code. He, want, he does it so much that he sandwiches uh, this code between two very explicit and clear statements about the Lord and, and what we're called to do. So look at verse 17. Before we get into the code, what does he say? The transition. He says, whatever you do, in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now look at the segue out of this list. Look at verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And just to make perfectly clear that, that these uh, household codes are to be done for the Lord and in the name of the Lord, look at, look at verses 18 on. Look at all the places where we see the name of the Lord being mentioned. We're to treat one another in this way. Why? As is fitting in the Lord, for this pleases the Lord. Fearing the Lord, you are serving the Lord Christ, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. I hope you're getting it. The family life is to be lived through Jesus, it's to be lived out like Jesus, and it's to be lived for Jesus. Paul wants to make sure we get this point. Being in Jesus changes everything. The household then is to be characterized by love and not by power. Which leads to the third point, and I think we need... We, we, we need to all be, be honest here that there are a lot of triggering ideas, triggering in the terms of how we use it today, ideas that are upsetting or confusing. And um, let, let's just own that reality. When we talk about submission, when we talk about slavery, these are things that are they're hard to understand. And why are they in the Bible? What does this mean? I also think, too, we need to be honest that, that sometimes we're triggered and upset by these words because they have the, the, um, people in positions of authority have abused, have abused, and they continue to abuse. Brothers and sisters, this, this cannot be. Let's make sure we understand that this cannot be. There's no room for abuse of power and authority anywhere in the family, and anywhere in the family of God. There is no room for that. But I also want to propose to you that this passage is equally triggering and upsetting to the Colossians but maybe not for the reasons that we're upset or triggered by this passage. And so what I'm asking for us all to do is maybe to suspend our 21st century uh, lenses in looking at this and really look at it and be and, and feel the, the, the shock of what the Colossians felt when they first heard this. So everybody good? So three things. Household codes were familiar breakdown of family roles in the Roman church, but they revolved around power of the husband and father. Paul uses familiar codes, but he emphasizes love and the lordship of Jesus, not power. And we need to suspend our, our, our 21st century reactions, and we need, to, um, we need to look at this through the first century lens to understand Paul's teaching. So let's jump into these three pairings, shall we? Look at verse 18 and 19. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives without harshness or bitterness. With all of these pairings, we must understand that equality in Jesus does not erase our distinctiveness, does it? It doesn't erase the way that we have been made. We are of one value and worth, but distinct in roles and as persons. In our equality, we all have the same responsibilities towards one another. We see that in verses 5 to 17. These are things that the family of God were all to do to one another. 
But within our distinctiveness, we have different responsibilities towards one another in the home. And we see this in, in verses 3.18 to 4.1. And Paul starts with wives. And don't, don't underestimate that. Household codes generally started with those in power, those who, who had the authority in, in the Roman world. Paul gives value and worth to the wives by starting there. And he says wives, because they are in Jesus and they're living like Jesus and living for Jesus, they are called to submit. Well, this simply means to order themselves under their husband. Now, let's make it sure this is not about obedience. Hear this. This is a willful decision made by a co-equal to align herself with and respect her husband. And it's something that's done as fitting to the Lord. It's done in submission to Jesus. One of the best definitions of this type of submission I've ever heard was, was from my dad. And uh, he, we were talking one time and he said, I'm in charge around here because your mother says so. <laughs> now, I don't think we can say that headship is strictly about being in charge. That's not the point here. But when it comes to this idea of submission, of ordering under, I hope you can see there's power in, in what my mom did of willfully submitting herself in, in, the, uh, in, in the roles. This never means strict obedience. I want to make sure we hear that. This is about an ordered sharing of responsibility in the home. Now let's turn to husbands. And this is where the shock is. I want you to hear this. The shock for the Colossians would have been in what the husbands were called to do because there's nothing about uh, practicing your authority or, or being in charge or being in control. No. This would have been radical for the Colossians to hear that husbands are, are, are called to love. And more than that, the, the love is supposed to be characterized by no bitterness, no harshness. And husbands, because they are in Jesus and living like Jesus and living for Jesus are called to just that, to love with gentleness and patience. Paul's shocking here again because he's, he's indicating that, that male headship is present, but it's, it's a headship that models the headship of Jesus. Let's never forget that. And what did Jesus do? He came to serve, to sacrifice, and to die for the sake of others. That is what is meant by a call for a husband to love his wife. Now, now think about it. When lived out together, this pattern of service and sacrifice, it doesn't only lend itself to creating a, a home of a peace and mutuality, right? It doesn't just end on the home, but it demonstrates Jesus to the world. Think about this. What did Jesus do? Didn't Jesus submit himself to the will of the Father? Yes. And didn't Jesus give his life in sacrificial service to all for God's sake? Yes. I like how the scholar Scott McKnight puts it when he says wives serve husbands and husbands sacrifice themselves for their wives because that is what love means. Submission and sacrifice. That is who Jesus is and what he has done on our behalf. And we can live that out in our homes and there can be peace and there can be mutuality. But don't forget, we are, we are showing the world that Jesus is real. Paul immediately jumps from pair to pair, so we're going to do the same thing. Living out our God-given roles also pertains to parents and to children. Look at verses 20 and 21. Children, you're called to obey their, par obey their parents. Now again, this is shocking. Children are being given personhood in this world. That wasn't something that happened. They were, they were being treated as fully responsible persons. And it's a call is simple. The call is to obey. It echoes the fifth command, right? To honor your father and mother. What does obey mean? It means to follow the rules. That is what children in the home are called to do. Now, it's not about following rules that are oppressive or danger endangering or abusive. It's about following parents who are in the Lord, who have been raised with Christ. And again, more shocking here is a reference to a parent's. The parent's job isn't to isn't to discipline and to exercise authority. No. The parent's job is to what? To not provoke their children. Parents, because they are in Jesus and living like Jesus and living for Jesus, will not embitter or exasperate or, or cause their children to lose heart. Paul's saying this. He's saying, don't parent your children in a way 
that will promote rebellion or resentment. Show them what it means to be raised with Christ. Help them to desire that. Help them to desire to be raised with Christ and lead them to being raised with Christ. That's the opposite of provoking. That's what parenting in the Lord means. Which leads to the third and final pairing of these roles, starting in 322 and ending at 4.1. We're talking about bond servants. And what are bond servants to do? They're to obey in everything, fearing the Lord. And masters are to treat their servants justly and fairly, providing for them, knowing that they have a master in heaven. And again, there's a few things we need to unpack before we jump into this pairing. We know that from the Bible that the relationship between husbands and wives and between parents and children were ordained by God, and they have they been here since the creation. But we also know that indentured service to, servitude and any other form of slavery are roles created by man. And they do not represent God's perfect will for creation. So Paul is offering some regulations here, but in no way is he commending or condoning slavery. Slavery and, and human trafficking deny the image of God in people. Let's make that very clear. It is an evil injustice that we are called to fight as followers of Jesus. Amen? That is what we're called to do. But that's not the point of the passage. Paul is talking about household order. Why would he talk about slaves in household order? Well, you need to understand the times. Some, people will, some scholars will say that up to half of the Roman Empire at this time were indentured servants, were, were bond servants. You see, the, the indentured servants, the bond service uh, model was, was a very imperfect way to deal with displaced persons. People were displaced for all sorts of reasons in the Roman Empire. There was war, there was uh, natural disasters, there was loss of family, there might have been loss of employment. And the only way you could handle displaced people was to invite them into homes. So bond servants were in the Roman home. It was what their homes were what their home life was about. And these folks would be in their homes where they would work to pay off a debt or they would provide uh, repayment for their housing. And sometimes they, sometimes they would be in a good home where it, they would actually be adopted into that home. But it was, it was simply uh, uh, an imperfect way to deal with a real problem. And immediately, Paul, in talking about household codes, he, again, he triggers the Colossians by giving bond servants dignity. You see, he addresses them as persons, not property, as they were known in that time. And his call is clear. If you're raised with Christ, if you are in Jesus, if you're living like Jesus, living for Jesus, then you're to fulfill your duties in service to the Lord. And again, shocking to the Colossians, masters are not called to exercise authority. They're not called to, to be in control. No, the call of masters is to provide, and to provide in a way that is fair and just. Because masters know, and Paul says, if you were raised to Christ, they know they have a master in heaven who has already done just that for them, right? God has provided for them in justice and in fairness. So taken all together in the grace and the love that comes from Jesus, as we are all gracious to one another, the home is a place where wives will... Submit fittingly, husbands love sacrificially and gently, children will obey rightly, and parents discipline unprovokingly, out of which workers work diligently and bosses act justly. That's it. That, that's God's call. That's God's call on all of us, and that's God's call on each of us. God wants the home of those who are raised with Christ to be a radical and normal place where we live out our ordered relationships for his honor and for the sake of of the world. How we act within our God-given roles in the family and in any other role we enter into matters to God. This matters to God. Don't forget that. God is clear. Look at verses 24 and 25. God is clear. We're either serving him and working for an inheritance from him or we will be paid back for the wrong we have done. And that wrong will be without partiality. Doesn't matter who you are. So whatever your role, we're to live out our new identity for the sake of Jesus and the good of the others. And when we serve and sacrifice one another, we live out the full picture of who Jesus is and what he has, what he has done for us. So what do we do with all this? What do we do with this passage 
that was written to this Colossian church about how they should interact with each other within the family. What does this have to do with us today? Well, I think these type of passages can bring out all sorts of things within us, right? I think there's a lot of temptations. I think there's a temptation first to look outward, and we see all the injustices that are out there, and there are so many. And we want to fight to change the world. Maybe we see all the sin, we see the pain, we see the corruption, and maybe we despair and feel hopeless. Or maybe worse than that, we judge. I'm glad I'm not like them. Or let's get even more, re- more real. Maybe some of us are sitting here pointing the finger at a parent or a spouse or a child. If only they would. Yes, the Bible calls us to fight injustice and to lament over sin, certainly. And God's word tells us not to judge others and to remove the log out of our own eyes before we judge. But I don't think fighting or lamenting or not judging are the main takeaways for us from this passage. Family of God, this is an intensely personal call for those of us who are in the Lord. This household code is about me. It's about you. Jesus and his gospel gets at each of us right where we live. So what's the call from this passage? Well, it's a call to each of us. Husbands, are you, are you, are you loving your wife? Are you being gentle? Gentleness, gentleness simply means power under control. Are you being gentle in your home? If somebody asked her, if she felt loved by you and safe around you and seen by you, what would she say in a safe place? Would she say that you're giving your all and sacrificing yourself for the good of of your, your family and for her? That's your call as husbands. Wives, does, does your husband feel seen by you and supported by you, cared for by you and served by you? Does he really believe that in his heart of hearts? Parents, are, are you loving your children and not being harsh with them? Is your discipline and correction, which needs to be there, is it pointing your children towards Jesus or away from him. Children, are you obeying your parents? Are you joyfully doing what you're asked to do in the home? And when we all leave the home, remember our universal call in verses 17 and 23. Whatever you do, Wherever you are in authority, outside the home, are you acting sacrificially in gentleness, in love, and concern for the success and well-being of others when you're in positions of authority? And whenever you are under authority, not abuse, let me be clear, not abuse, when you are under authority, are you joyfully fulfilling your commitment to that person and to the Lord? In talking through this passage and this idea this week, Pastor Jeff said it better than than me when he stated this. Those of us in positions of authority and power are to function in those positions like King Jesus did in service and sacrificial giving. Let me say that one more time. Those of us in positions of authority and power are to function in those positions like King Jesus did in service and sacrificial giving. And... Those under authority are to live like King Jesus did in joyful submission and faithful obedience. Those of us under authority are to live like King Jesus did in joyful submission and faithful obedience. Now, I don't want to get in the game of prescribing what exactly it looks like for you to do these things in your home and in your world. But I do think a good exercise for us all, is to go home and in our families 
Talk with our spouses. Talk with our children. Maybe talk in our places of employment. Talk with one another. Ask those who you live with and do life with if they are experiencing the love and the goodness of Jesus. If they are experiencing the submission and the self-sacrifice of who Jesus is. Oh, that in every role I find myself, and that every role you find yourself, that we would do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus, working heartily as unto God and not unto men. May that be so of me, and, and may that be so of us, and may it help the watching world turn to Jesus, and may his name be praised. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It is so practical and clear. And thank you for, for Jesus who, who submitted himself to you and came to sacrifice for us all. Father, thank you that we have the opportunity to worship him and be with him forever for what he has done on our part. Help us to show the world that Jesus is real in the way that we submit and serve and sacrifice for one another, specifically in our homes and in the world at large. Father, do this work in our lives. Do this work through us. And may the fame of your name grow. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.